The Genesis Account of Origins, Part 3. We've been going through a couple of books, uh, both of them edited by uh, Gerald Klingbeil, Genesis Creation Account and its Reverberations in the Old Testament, and he spoke and it was. Um, there are the, the covers of the two books. The Genesis Creation Account is more technical. Um, the uh, He Spoke and It Was has uh, fewer notes and they're all piled in the back. Um, we've been going through chapter 3. We're now th to part 3 um, of the Genesis Accounts of Origins by Richard Davidson. Is it Andrews? And you may remember that earlier on we had seen in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and we spent the uh, last two weeks uh, going through in the beginning, and now we're going to cover the other three, zoom. Um, the who in the beginning God, and I think that that should have been italicized in the original, but for some reason, at least uh, in the, uh, in the uh, uh, Kindle version, it's not. Uh, the creation accounts of Genesis 1 and 2 emphasize the character of God. While actor, accurately presenting the facts of creation, the emphasis is undoubtedly not so much upon creation as upon the creator. As Matthews puts it, God is the grammatical subject of the first sentence and continues as the thematic subject throughout the account. Elohim and Yahweh, the character of God. In Genesis 1 and 2, two different names for God appear, not as supporting evidence for the documentary hypothesis, but in order to emphasize the two major character uh, qualities of the Creator. In Genesis 1, 1 to 2, uh, to 2, 4a, he is Elohim, which is a generic name for God, meaning all-powerful one, and emphasizing his transcendence as the universal, cosmic, self-existent, almighty, infinite God. This emphasis on, upon God's transcendence is in accordance with the universal framework of the first creation account in which God is before and above creation and creates effortlessly by his divine word. In the supplementary creation account of Genesis 2, 4b through 25, another name for the deity is introduced along with Elohim. He is here also Yahweh, which is God's covenant name. He is the imminent personal God who enters into intimate relationship with his creatures. Just such a God is depicted in this second creation account, one who bends down as a potter over a lifeless lump of clay to shape or form Yatsar, the man, and breathes into his nostrils the breath of life. Verse 2, uh, pardon me, chapter 2, verse 7. Who plants a garden, verse 8, and who architecturally designs or builds, Bana, the woman, and officiates at the first wedding. Only the Judeo-Christian God is both infinite and personal to meet the human need of an infinite reference point and a personal relationship. Any interpretation of the biblical account of origins must recognize the necessity of remaining faithful to this twofold portrayal of God's character in the opening chapters of Scripture. Interpretations of these chapters which present God as an accomplice, active or passive, in an evolutionary process of survival of the fittest over millions of years of predation prior to the fall of, an, of humans must seriously reckon with how these views impinge upon the character of God. Evolutionary creation, theistic evolution, or progressive creationism make God responsible for millions of years of death, suffering, natural selection, and survival of the fittest even before sin. Such positions seem to malign the character of God, and the biblical interpreter should pause to consider whether such interpretations of origins are consistent with the explicit de depictions of God's character in Genesis 1 and 2 and elsewhere in Scripture. That's Davidson's take on that. He has several other considerations that he lists. I found something I could skip profitably. Uh, no proof of God is provided, but rather from the outset comes the bold assertion of his existence. Just that's the way it is. God is the ultimate foundation of reality, as Ellen White expresses it, in the beginning God, here alone, can the mind in its eager questioning, fleeing as the dove to the ark, find rest. 
The portrayal of God in the creation account provides a polemic against the polytheism of the ancient Near East with its many gods, their moral decadence, the rivalry, rivalry and struggle among the deities, their mortality, and their pantheism. The gods are actually part of the uncreated world matter in their system. There are intimations of the plurality of Godhead, of the Godhead in creation. With mention of the Spirit of God, Ruach Elohim, in Genesis 1-2, and that should be a note and I missed putting it up. The creative word throughout the creation account, 10 times in Genesis 1, and the let us of Genesis 1-26, most probably is a plural of fullness, implying within the divine being the distinctions of personalities, a plurality within the deity, a unanimity of intention and plan. The germinal idea of interdivine deliberation among persons within the divine being. By the way, those are his ellipses. The who of creation also helps us understand the why of creation, with intimations of a plurality of persons within the deity and the character of God being one of covenant love as Yahweh. It would be only natural for him to wish to create other beings with whom he could share fellowship. This is implicit in the creation account of Proverbs 8, where wisdom, a hypostasis for the pre-incarnate Christ, is rejoicing, literally playing or sporting, both with Yahweh and with the humans who have been created. It is explicit in Isaiah 45, 18. He did not create it meaning the earth, to be empty. And the word that's used for empty is tohu, as in tohu wabohu, but formed it to be inhabited. The how, in the beginning, God created. Many scholars claim that the biblical creation accounts are not concerned with the how of creation, but only with the theological point that God created. It is true that Genesis 1 and 2 provide no technical scientific explanation of the divine creative process, although it's interesting to ask the question, could they? Um, but there is a great deal of attention to the how of divine creation, and this cannot be discarded as the husk of creation accounts in order to get at the theological kernel of truth that God was the creator. Though not given in technical scientific language, Genesis nevertheless describes the reality of the divine creative process using clear observational language. It seems that the events of the six days of creation are told from the perspective of one who is standing on the earth's surface observing the universe with the naked eye. The biblical text gives several indicators of the how of creation. By divine bara, or he created, According to Genesis 1, God creates by divine bara, or create. This Hebrew verb in the call uh, describes exclusively God's action. It is never used of human activity. It is also never used with the accusative of matter. What is created is something totally new and effortlessly produced. By itself, the term does not indicate creatio ex nihilo. See Psalms 51.12 or Ten in the English version, um, the Hebrew numbers are different from English, as has sometimes been claimed. However, in the context of the entire verse of Genesis 1-1, taken as an independent clause describing actual new material creation of the entire universe, creatio ex nihilo is explicitly affirmed. By employing this term, the Genesis account provides an implicit polemic against the common ancient Near East view of creation by sexual procreation and by a struggle with the forces of chaos. By di divine fiat, and this is one place I had a little trouble because fiat is simply Latin for let there be. As in fiat lux, let there be light. Creation in Genesis 1 is also by di divine fiat. And God said, let there be. The psalmist summarizes this aspect of how God created. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. 
Again, those are his ellipses. But according to Genesis 1, the universe and his earth are not, and this earth are not self-existent, random, or struggled for. The Genesis account is in stark contrast with the Mesopotamian concept of creation, resulting from the cosmogenic, cosmogonic struggle among rival deities or the sexual activity of the gods. And this is also in contrast with Egyptian Memphite theology, where the creative speech of the god Ta is a magical utterance. In biblical theology, the word of God is concrete. It is the embodiment of power. When God speaks, there is immediate response and creative action. Part of God's word is his blessing. And in Hebrew thought, God's blessing is the empowering of the one or thing blessed to fulfill the intended function for which she, he, or it was made. God's creation by divine fiat underscores the centrality of the word in the creation process. As a polemic, specific terminology is used or avoided by the narrator, which appears to be an intentional polemic against the mythological struggle with a chaos monster and the polytheistic deities found in the Mesopotamian creation texts. We have noted some examples of these already. As an additional example, the word to home, or deep, in Genesis 1-2 is an unmythologized masculine rather than the mythological feminine sea monster Tiamat, who was destroyed in, uh, uh, by Marduk in the uh, uh, most recent uh, Mesopotamian story. Again, the name sun and moon are substituted with generic terms greater light and lesser light because the Hebrew names for these luminaries are also the names of deities. There may be another reason, by the way, and, and uh, we will get to that next week. As a final example, the term Tananim, sea monsters, verses 21 and 22, the name for both mythological creatures and natural sea creatures or serpents is retained as the only voc vocabulary available to express this kind of animal, but this usage is coupled in, with the strongest term for creation, namely bara, implying something totally new with no struggle, a term not employed in Genesis 1 since verse 1 to, destroy, to dispel any thought of a rival god. The how of creation was no doubt penned by the narrator under inspiration with a view towards exposing and warning against the polytheistic Egyptian environment surrounding Israel before the Exodus, and the Canaanite environment in which Israel would soon find themselves. But the omniscient divine author certainly also inspired the creation account in order to be a polemic for all time against views of creation that might violate or destroy the true picture of God's creative work. The inspired description of God's effortless, personal, and rapid creation by divine fiat protects modern humanity from accepting naturalistic, violent, and random components as part of our picture of creation. Dramatically and aesthetically, God is portrayed in Genesis 1 and 2 as the master designer, creating dramatically and aesthetically. We have already noted in the previous section how God, like a potter, Yatsar, formed the man, and like an architect, Bana, designed or built, the woman. When he made this world, he, certainly, he surely could have created it in an instant if he had chosen to do so, but he instead dr dramatically choreographed the pageant over seven days. Note the aesthetic symmetry of the very structure of God's creation in space and time. Similar to the Hebrew aesthetic technique of synthetic parallelism in which a series of words, acts, or scenes is completed, by a matching series. God is both scientist and artist. And there follows the listing of the three days of forming and the three days of filling in parallel. In the span of six days, we've already dis discussed the literal six days of creation with regard to the when of creation, but this concept is also an important concept of the how of creation. On the one hand, according to Genesis 1, God's method of creation is not an instantaneous, timeless act in which all things, as described in Genesis 1 and 2, in one momentary flash, suddenly appeared. Contrary to the suppositions of Greek dualistic philosophy, which influenced the worldview of early Christian 
thinkers, such as Origen and Augustine. Uh, by the way, I will point out that it didn't influence that many others. Uh, Origen and Augustine are the two people who suggest that God created inst instantaneously. Uh, everybody else seems to accept the sixth day, including people like Basil, who wrote a whole series of sermons on it. Um, and still underlies the methodology of much of Catholic, Protestant, and modern thought, God is not essentially timeless and unable to enter into spatiotemporal reality. Which would be a little weird anyway, because God should be able to get into reality if he's going to create anything, uh, including such things as the resurrection, resurrection of Jesus. Genesis 1 and 2 underscore that God actually created in time as well as in space, creating the raw materials of the earth during a period of time before creation week, and then deliberately and dramatically forming and filling these inorganic pre-fossil materials throughout the seven-day creation week. Thus, Genesis 1 and 2 serve as a strong bulwark against Greek dualistic thought and call the contemporary interpreter back to radical biblical realism in which God actually enters time and space, creates in time and space, and calls it very good. On the other hand, the method of creation in Genesis 1 and 2 is also a powerful witness against accepting the creation week as occupying long ages of indefinite time, as claimed by proponents of progressive creationism. We have found that Genesis 1, 3 to 2, 3 clearly refer to the creation week as several, seven literal, historical, contiguous, creative, natural 24-hour days. Uh, personally, I would prefer to call them evening morning days because I don't know whether they're 24.5 hours or something like that. But certainly the, the general kind of days we have now. We have further concluded that all life on planet Earth was creating dur created during this creation week, days 3 through 6, and not before. Any attempt to bring long ages into the creation week, either through some kind of progressive creation or other non-literal, non-historical interpretation of the creation week of Genesis 1, is out of harmony with the original intent of the, intention of the text. We have cited numerous quotations from both critical and conservative scholars that acknowledge this fact. Likewise, we have seen that Genesis 1 demands an interpretation of rapid creation for the life forms of, on this planet, plants on day three, fish and fowl on day five, and the other animals and humans on day six. There's no room in the biblical text for the drawn-out process of evolution, even so-called rapid evolution, to operate as a methodology to explain the origin of life during creation week. The what? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The heavens and the earth, meaning the universe, in Genesis 1.1. Some have interpreted the phrase in Genesis 1.1, the heavens and the earth, that is, et hashemayim ve'et ha'aretz, uh, to refer only to this earth and its surrounding heaven, heavenly spheres, that is, the atmosphere and perhaps beyond to include the solar system. This interpretation is following the contextual lead of the uses of usages of the term heavens and earth later in Genesis 1, especially verses 8 and 10, and cannot be absolutely ruled out as a possible way of understanding this phrase. However, significant differences may be noted between the use of the phrase the heavens and the earth in the opening verse of Genesis 1 compared to the use of the two terms heavens and earth separately later in the chapter. In Genesis 1 and 1, both the heavens and the earth contain the article, that is, it's Hashemayim rather than just Shemayim, and Ha'aretz rather than Aretz. Whereas when these are named in Genesis 1, 8 through 10, they do not have the article. They're just Shemayim and Aretz. More importantly, Genesis 1, 1 features a dyad of terms, that is, the heavens and the earth, Whereas Genesis 1, 8, and 10 employ a, a triad. It defines heavens as Shemayim, then it defines, or pardon me, the firmament as Shemayim, and then it defines the dry land as earth, Aretz, and then um, the gathering together of waters as being seas. 
Genesis commentators generally agree that when used together as a pair in the Hebrew Bible, the dyad of terms, the heavens and the earth, constitute a merism that's taking parts to represent the whole, sort of like from head to foot. For the totality of all creation in the cosmos, that is what we would describe as the entire universe, and that such is also the case in Genesis 1.1. As Sailhammer puts it, by linking these two extremes into a single expression, sky and land, or heavens and earth, the Hebrew language expresses the totality of all that exists. I am persuaded that this observation is most likely valid. Thus, Genesis 1.1, as we have already intimated in an earlier section of the study, refers to the creation of the entire universe which took place in the beginning, prior to the seven-day creation week of Genesis 1.3 to 2.3. It is important to emphasize that this still strongly implies creatio ex nihilo, creation out of nothing. God is not indebted to pre-existing matter. We also repeat here for emphasis that the whole universe was not created in six days, as some ardent conservative creationists have mistakenly claimed. Furthermore, if the passage, uh, passive gap two-stage creation interpretation is correct, then the Creation of the heavens and the earth during the span of time termed in the beginning encompassed the whole galactic universe, and probably the whole supergalactic universe, he would say, including the planet earth in its unformed and unfilled condition. Heavens, earth, and sea, the global habitats of our planet. By contrast to the spotlight on the entire universe in Genesis 1-1, and again in, matching, in the matching member of the inclusion of Genesis 2, 4a. The use of the dyad, the heavens and the earth, in Genesis 1, 2, and the reference to the earth by itself, uh, that's, there's a mistake there because the heavens and the earth are in Genesis 1, 1. Uh, first placing the noun, the earth, in the emphatic position as the first word in the Hebrew clause, move the focus of this verse and the rest of the chapter to this planet. Um, so we, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and now the earth was. The use of the triad heavens, earth, and seas mentioned and named in Genesis 1, 8 through 11, describes the basic threefold habitat of our planet, sky, land, and water. This threefold habit was the object of God's creative power during the six days of creation, as he filled these habitats with vegetation, birds, fish, land animals, and humans. At the conclusion of the six days of creation, the narrator summarizes the creation of this threefold habitat by indicating that thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. By adding the phrase, all the host of them, the narrator makes clear that he is not employing the dyad, or merism, which refers to the entire universe, as in 1.1 and 2.4a, but is referencing what was created during the six days of creation week. Exodus 20 likewise, uh, 11 likewise refers back to this triad, stating that, well, a similar triad anyway, stating that in the six days God made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and of course, and all that in, in them is. Um, the habitats of this planet, not the galactic universe. Thus, Genesis 1.1 followed by Genesis 2.4 refers to God's creation of the whole universe, while the remainder of Genesis 1, summarized by Genesis 2.1, and Exodus 20.11 describe the creation of the three habitats of planet Earth. Sailhammer insightfully calls attention to the distinction between Genesis 1.1, where the dyad heavens and earth refers to the entire universe, and the shift to this earth in the remainder of Genesis 1. Unfortunately, however, he then goes astray when he suggests that the term Ha'aretz, or the earth, seen in Genesis 2 throughout the account of the six-day creation, some 20 times in Genesis 1.2 to 2.1, and in the fourth commandment, Exodus 20, 11, be translated as the land. And he would translate it beyond that to say it's specifically referring to the land of Israel, uh, the land between the Euphrates and the river of Egypt, and not the rest of the land. 
And he emphasizes that it refers only to the localized promised land for Israel and not the whole planet's land surface. Likewise, he errs when he maintains that the term Hashemayim, or the heavens, in Genesis 1, account of creation, we are, we, refers only to the region above the localized promised land. I am convinced that the context replete with global, that is, planet-wide terms throughout Genesis 1 makes Sailhammer's restricted interpretation of this chapter highly unlikely. It seems extremely arbitrary and, in fact, virtually impossible to limit the descriptions of creation week in Genesis 1, 3 through 31 to the land between the Euphrates and the river of Egypt. How can the dividing of the light from the darkness, verse 3, occur only in the promised land and not elsewhere? How can the waters be divided from the waters only over the land promised to Israel, that Israel emerged at this time? How can the waters be gathered into one place called seas in the promised land? How can the greater light rule the day and the lesser light rule the night only in a localized area? How can birds fly across the sky only above the promised land? It doesn't make a lot of sense. How can the sea creatures have been designed for the localized area of the future boundaries of Israel? Uh, sea creatures don't seem to be localized to the uh, eastern Mediterranean. How can the command given to humans to fill the earth and their ch uh, charge to have dominion over all the earth be limited to one localized area? I guess you're only supposed to live in uh, the land of Israel. All of this language is clearly global, not just limited to a small geographical area. That the language of creation in Genesis 1, 3 through 31 is global in extent is confirmed in the succeeding chapters of Genesis 1 through 11. The trajectory of major themes through Genesis 1, uh, throughout Genesis 1 through 11, the creation, the fall, the plan of salvation, the spread of sin. Uh, yes, uh, let's say... Uh, Get your comment on tape here. Is this on? Okay. Yeah. It seems to be missing a, um, a point here. If you're talking about a 24-hour day, <clears throat> that has to refer to only as a localized location. Otherwise, you're going to get, uh, if, you, if you look at the global earth, uh, you see both day and night at the same time. Um, the only way you can talk about a 24-hour day is at a specific location on the surface of the Earth. Um, as uh, as uh, Davidson pointed out, the narrator is giving the narration as if he is on a point at first floating on the water and then later on as land is uh, uh, observing it uh, on a localized point as he's describing it. And uh, I agree with you that the uh, that day and night goes all the way around the globe. Yeah, you, you can't define day except that it's defining a specific point. Well, the that Earth. depends. We have managed to define it somehow already in the modern world. We just draw an arbitrary line between Alaska and Russia and extend it out. Um, in, a, in a world in which... The dry land may have been all in one uh, large interconnected patch uh, with an area of ocean in between. For practical purposes, one could still use that uh, way of dividing, and it may have been easier in the ancient times than it is now. Well, I'm just saying that this, this, uh, this comment about it's got to be a global description just is not consistent with, with other statements that are given in there as well. Um, comment in the back here. Just a minute, we want to get you. To do what he's uh, trying to make a stab at, you'd have to slow down the rotation of planets so uh, extremely that one side would burn, the other side would freeze. Well, Think of it's 500 years of light on one side, that's all going to burn, and then the other side is feeding for 500 years. You got a problem. 
Yeah, it's uh, if you try to make an evening and a morning in, into a model, uh, it seems like you're going to have to have days that are reasonably close to what we have now. Perhaps, you know, again, maybe a half an hour faster or half an hour slower or something like that, but at least in the general range of what we have now. Um, because if you, spread it, if you slow it down too much, then, uh, then you do have the problem of uh, one side of the earth baking and the other side of the earth uh, freezing. That's what happens on the moon. The, the uh, temperature goes up to, what, two, 300 degrees, something like that, on the hot side and uh, centigrade. And then uh, on the low side, it drops way down uh, to well below freezing. Um, yeah, if, if you have the dry land appearing in one place, which seems to be the implication, uh, then you would still have a space in between that where uh, if you were sailing across it, you might have some difficulty. But if you're if just staying in one place day and night still makes sense. The trajectory of major themes throughout Genesis 1 through 11, the creation, the fall, the plan of salvation, the spread of sin, the judgment by the flood, God's covenant with the earth, are all global in their scope. There are also many occurrences of global terms in the flood narrative, including several intertextual linkages with Genesis 1. Of course, there are those who claim that the flood was not global either. Moreover, after the flood... The precise command that was given to Adam is repeated to Noah. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Noah was not even in the promised land when this command was given. Probably up in Anatolia. And the following chapter of the Table of Nations indicates that this command was to be fulfilled globally, not just in a localized area. See, so especially 1032, the nations were divided on the earth after the flood. Uh, the nations were not, not divided in the land of Israel. And you, now you're going to have to recognize that Aretz sometimes means more than the land of Israel. This global language continues in Genesis 11, where the whole earth involves all the languages of the earth, verses 8 through 9. There can be little doubt that throughout Genesis 1 through 11, these references and many others involve global and not localized language. And the creation of the earth in Genesis 1, 3 through 31 must perforce also be global in extent. Now, most people recognize that the story is, is pretending to be, or uh, if I can say it, is proposing to be global. Uh, he's writing this because he is specifically saying that Salehammer's solution um, to meshing geology with the, uh, uh, with the Genesis account um, really doesn't come from the Genesis account itself, and I think he's right about that. This conclusion is also s substantiated by comparing the creation account of Genesis 1 to its parallel creation account in Proverbs 8, 22 through 31. References to Haaretz, the earth in Proverbs 8, 23, 26, and 29 are in the context clearly global in extent, the foundations of the earth. And this further demonstrated by the parallelism between Haaretz, the earth, and the clearly global term Tebel. I'm sorry, that's Tebel, world, in, room, in verse 26. Thus we cannot accept Salehammer's suggestion that the earth, the heavens, and the heavens should be translated land and sky and specifically restricted to the area uh, over Genesis, uh, of the promised land. And the, in Genesis 1, 2, in the following words, and refer to anything less than a global creation. Now, that's the end of this uh, section. And then we'll have more interesting things uh, in probably a couple of weeks. Um, I like the way Davidson is explicating the text. 
Uh, most explicating of the text, frankly, is done with one eye on the 600-pound gorilla in the room, namely the sta that standard geological theory will not allow a six-literal contiguous evening-morning, approximately 24-hour day creation. Thus, Sailhammer can interpret the text mostly correctly because he's found a device to harmonize the literal text with science, or what he considers to be science. Davidson can't say this, as he is only dealing with the text. His training isn't primarily in, uh, in, uh, in science. But Sailhammer's scheme is problematic scientifically as well as scripturally. If God created only on the promised land, then what is the relationship between that creation and the creation or evolution or whatever you want to call it of the uh, land surrounding it? Because if we're trying to restrict this to the promised land, there are animals in other places. There are birds in other places. The birds that fly across, does that mean that God uh, created just like whatever was there before? Um, in which case, raises some interesting questions about God's creation just on the promised land. Was the flood also only on the promised land? Uh, Perhaps more importantly, can we find geological evidences of this flood? If you're trying to make this a local thing. Uh, I haven't seen anybody actually tackle that. Um, and another further question is, if the, there was a flood that covered the promised land, then it would have all run off into either the Mediterranean or the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea should have a lot more water in it than it does. How did the Dead Sea dry out so fast? Uh, if we resort to miracles to solve these problems, which is one way of doing it, by what rationale do we not resort to more global miracles? In that case, why not take the obvious meaning of Haaretz, namely the earth? And Sailhammer is right except for that one point, and you just, uh, you just take him and run with him. But Sailhammer is not alone in this way of doing things where you try to adjust the biblical record to fit modern geology. Other commentators on equally specious grounds argue that the days are not literal, or that they're not contiguous, or they're not evening, morning days, they're days of thousands or perhaps millions or perhaps hundreds of millions of years. Still other commentators assert that the Hebrews were totally ignorant and believe many ideas which we now find ridiculous, such as a domed metallic sky over a flat earth. We're going to come back to that later on. These commentators take ideas not found in the text and import them from uh, sometimes the surrounding culture and sometimes from 19th century mi um, misperceptions of the surrounding culture and just import them lock, stock, and barrel. This makes it easier for these commentators to reject the idea that Moses could teach us anything because he had such a ridiculous idea about how the earth was constructed. I think the solution is to recognize the 600-pound gorilla and kill it. That is the, to say, Lyell said to a friend that he intended to free geology from Moses. That implies that Moses didn't get it right, and Lael was trying to get it right by getting rid of Moses. Now, that means that modern geology is not unbiased. It also means that if a discipline is er erected with one of its guiding principles being to contradict the Bible, it cannot be harmonized with the Bible unless it, either it or the Bible is changed, because it was designed that way. If one wants to remain faithful to the Bible, then standard geology, geologic theory must be challenged. Now, Davidson may not be the man to do this in this book. He's only dealing with what the Old Testament says, not, not how to harmonize that with uh, what we know about science. But someone should. And I hope I've done a little bit of that. And we'll continue to do more, and we're going to have some fun with some of that, I think, in the near future. Uh, but that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Yes, comment here.
goes back a long, long way. I was in the academy, and our Bible teacher had gone to a Bible conference, and he came back talking about the way earth was created and made it sound like there was a lot created before the earth. I went home and asked my parents about it, and my mother hit the ceiling. And she said, he has never read what Ellen White says about um, not depending on pre-existing uh, materials. Mm -hmm. And so I took this quotation back to class and <laughs> anyway, <laughs> in much later, I worked on the translation of the Bible commentary from English into Spanish. And the chapter on creation, the, the introduction, was rewritten by Robert Brown in 1982. And it has this statement, again, uh, about um, no previous... No pre uh, pre God was not dependent on pre-existing yeah. matter. And so I, f I went back to that this week, and I then I went to look at Ellen G. White statements regarding geology and earth sciences by the E.G. White estate in 1982, and I found the same quotations that were in Brown's translation, uh, Brown's new version of the commentary. Mm -hmm. So my question is, have we had anything else that the has been said since 1982 where this uh, the idea that many stumble over that God did not create matter when he brought the world into existence limits the power of the Holy One of Israel, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Have, have we said anything else, or is this the way it stands? Well, you will notice that... Um that, Davidson uh, isn't isn't on that. He does different. Yeah, David Davidson has a creatio ex nihilo coming right out of the text, um, but it's a creatio ex nihilo, nihilo uh, some distance, and it's not clear how, how far back from the actual creation week on Earth itself. Um, I think that that remains faithful to the intent. Um, uh, I, I think, though, that there are there are some uh, uh, there are some matters that we haven't actually dealt with much, and um, this book's probably not the uh, not the place that they're going to be dealt with so much because um, he's looking at what does the text say. And, and what we're asking is a slightly different question, and that is how can we model what uh, the text says in ways that will produce um, scientific predictions that will help us to uh, uh, make, well, they'll help us to make scientific predictions that we can test, and then hopefully they'll come out uh, to be, to pass the test. My, my question is whether we as a church are, are affirming still what was affirmed in 1982. I, I, think we're, I think we're coming back to that. In actually. the formation of our world, God was not beholden to pre-existent substance or matter. See. Now, there, there is one point that I think deserves uh, emphasis. It may turn out to be that the Big Bang is not uh, the best model. There are some plasma models out there that, that shorten the period down to, uh, uh, say, a hundred million years or thereabouts, um, which of course isn't nearly enough time for evolution to have taken place, mm -hmm. and which therefore will be uh, vigorously opposed by those who try to use evolution as a way to explain how life got on Earth but which would allow, let's say, an earth to have been created, and then whenever God, God got around to it, he comes back and he works on it. Well, now, read I'm that. Mostly, I'm mostly interested in what we have done 
have, do we have any different story than we had uh, back in this 80, 1982 thing that is, that is rebutting what had been said before? Because it says, it uses the quotation, the theory that God did not create matter when he brought the world into existence is without foundation. Yeah. Well, the question is, when did he bring the world into existence? Yeah. It, it's, it's, the whole thing is, is interesting, but it, as I say, it goes back to a, a, a discussion that comes from my youth. We were talking well, these, about that earlier. These are, not, these are not new questions. Yes. Yeah, I, I think the, the Adventist church has, in general, taken the position that there was matter here before the creation week from an earlier creation of the universe. And this is based probably largely on the history of the great controversy in which there was war in heaven and Satan was cast down to the earth. And then creation took place. Ellen White points out creation took place after that. Uh, so uh, in that scenario, we, we t tend to take the idea, well, uh, you know, maybe all the whole universe wasn't created just 6,000 years ago. So it helps solve a lot of scientific questions when you do that. Uh, the uh, this issue has been discussed a long time in Adventism, in fact, way back to the Review and Herald, uh, 1860, Uriah Smith, probably, he's not uh, bylined at the bottom of the comment, but uh, he was the editor at that time. He says, nor is there anything in Revelation which forbids us to believe that the substance of the earth was formed long before it re uh, received its present organi organization. The best verse of Genesis may relate to a period of millions of ages prior to the events noticed in the rest of the chapter. Uh, back in 1898, M.C. Wilcox, again, he was editor of the review, and that's byline by him, uh, when did God create or bring into existence the heaven and the earth? In the beginning. When this beginning was, how long a period it covered, it is idle to conjecture, for it is not revealed that it was a period which mandated the six days' work is evident. Then I uh, might point out, I uh, wrote an article in the Advance Review in 1898, it was published then. I say 1898, I mean 1998. Uh, 1898. Well, uh, I'm old, getting, I don't think that old. I'm getting that old, watch it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, uh, and uh, there, uh, I do quote a statement by Ellen White, that's where she states, in the work of creation, when the dawn of the first day broke and the heavens and the earth, by the call of infinite power, came out of darkness. Sounds like we had a dark earth there before. Uh, Job 38.9 talks about the swaddling bat darkness, a swaddling band around the earth. So it would have been dark, but there may have been other luminaries around. But the earth itself was dark because it had this swaddling band around it. So that's that particular interpretation. And uh, uh, Bob Brown uh, has taken a strong position. Uh, you know, Doc Brown used to be director of the Geoscience Research Institute. Uh, passed away a couple of years ago. He very much has defended the idea that the universe is much older than the events from creation week. In other words, it was a universe before creation week. Uh, and uh, now some Adventists take the position that, no, everything was created in six days. 
And they based that the on stars. Ellen White. Uh, well, yes, and they use the statements like you you mentioned right there that uh, God was, and she says when the Sabbath was formed, uh, uh, this this is when. Uh, well, let me just check here. The Sabbath institution, which originally is as old as the world, she makes that statement. But uh, what do you mean by the by the world? Well, maybe it's the created world. Uh, so the, she does not address that issue directly. Uh, at present, I think in general, most scientists in the Adventist Church favor. Uh, an older universe, a recent creation, but there are a few that don't. Now, um, Davidson's interpretation seems to leave room for, uh, for that kind of thing. No, it's okay. You, we're going to let you uh, comment and then we'll... Oh, yep. Okay. Yeah, that Am I on? Go ahead. I'm on. Okay. <laughs> You're both on. Steve next. You can talk to each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've had a kind of a long involvement in this issue because any time you put even one foot or a big toe into Adventist geology, this subject will always come up, and I've had a lifelong interest in geology. Early on, I took a master's degree in geology from Michigan State University. And I was trying to find creationists on that campus that, as an Adventist, I could link up with, find something in common. And there was a professor of uh, biological education, an educator, not necessarily a science, but an educator, uh, John N. Moore. And he was one of the leaders back then, along with Henry Morris, of the creation early creation work, and this is in the 1970s. I remember going to his house for dinner, and that was a real privilege to enter a professor's home and we could uh, dialogue. Well, this topic came up, and he kind of spilled his concern to me. He said, now, you're Adventist. Uh, you Adventists uh, go too far on this idea of the universe being old, because the fourth commandment says, in six days the Lord made heaven, earth, sea, and all that in them is. That includes the globe itself, the foundations, everything. He said, you're, uh, you're reading into scripture something that's not there. Well, he helped. He wasn't a founder of the Creation Research Society, but he was a strong supporter. And all of those early uh, you know, founders, including our own Adventist, uh, Marsh, Frank M. Marsh, uh, all stuck to this very literal interpretation of the fourth commandment, all that in them is. So that's, that's another issue that we have to keep one eye on. And these are good points. Ellen White, I have a lot more to say on that, but I want to hear what Steve has to say. Okay. Yeah, you know, this... this we, we always refer to this statement about God not beholding the pre-existing matter, but it's, to me that's really a statement of his capacity as creator, not what he did, uh, not necessarily what he did. He did not have to rely on pre-existing matter. It doesn't mean he didn't use pre-existing matter. Uh, when he created Adam, obviously it says he created him from the dust of the ground. He used pre-existing matter to create Adam. So if we're going to be totally exhaustive about using that, interpreting that statement that way, then we got a contradiction there with, with how he created Adam. Um, the, the, the issue is that we, we, we want to make Genesis an exhaustive explanation of how things came into existence. It's not. There's so much that's left out. We don't know how the angels were created. We know that there's life that had existed in the universe, according to Ellen White, if there were the other worlds that existed before creation week. Ariel, right? That's, I mean, that's the, the sequence, right? So the, the fact that we say that all life was created during creation week is not true if we interpret Ellen White correctly. God created life throughout the universe if there were the other worlds that preexisted, that were yeah. there. The so question, to say uh, that this was a sterile planet 
or a sterile universe is not true. It is not necessarily true. Well, I think you can make a good case for this not being a sterile universe. It's a little harder case to make that this was not a sterile planet. Well, I, even Davidson, he's, he's being very biased about it because he says right in, right in the statements that you said that, uh, that the Earth uh, was made of pre-organic, pre-fossil material. I mean, he's, he's obviously assuming that's true in his interpretation before he interprets interpret what he reads in Genesis. Well, and, and that's, that he's going outside of Genesis to get that. Well, he's not quite. And the reason why is because in order to get, uh, in order to get something that's not unformed and unfilled, you have to translate verse... Two, and the earth became. Well, we and it doesn't, you know, that's not really a good translation. And so he's within, he's within his exegetical rights to say uh, there is no suggestion of, of life on earth existing before God created vegetation and and, and uh, birds and fish and uh, swimming things and, and, uh, and flying things, really, should, we should say, and, uh, and moving things on land. That even if you were to say, well, maybe there was some algae here, first of all, it's, there's been several instances and one that just cropped up in the last couple of weeks that I ran into where people have been drilling down quite a ways and found living algae at you know depths that would ordinarily have been thought to preclude them. So that even if you find um, uh, say algae in Precambrian, I don't think you can say f with, with certainty that, that uh, those things didn't grow there after the rocks were formed. Be because obviously they're doing that today. Yeah, but we know of many mechanisms in which life can be transported across the solar system and possibly in between from star to star. Uh, yes, know. but we don't know many mechanisms whereby you will create, uh, uh, let's say, take algae and turn them into uh, dinosaurs or humans. Well, of we course. We don't really yeah. have those mechanisms. I, well, I, there are people I'm who not claim we do, but they're not. I'm not saying that God's hand was not in his, you know, is, is unnecessary in bringing about life as we know it on this planet. Uh, the complexity is just too much there. It's, it's just that I'm saying that, that to assume that this rest, of the, that the, when there's, if there's life throughout the universe prior to creation week, right. there are mechanisms that will, uh, that in principle, anyway, can allow, allow, uh, can, uh, allow life to move throughout the universe. In, in a natural way, if 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 there were you know nat mechanisms uh, in which stars and planets are uh, you know following the the the, the, the uh, physical processes that we observe in the universe now, um, so um, I'm, I'm just you know I'm just saying like, like Selhammer, he was trying to make the point that there was a place in Genesis 1 where prior to creation week there could be dinosaurs existing. That was, that was his point. Uh, I mean that's what he's trying to show that you could interpret a Genesis in, in a way in which there was a place in which life could exist prior to creation week. And uh, uh, so I mean that's where he was trying to get to. And well I know that's where he's trying to get to. That's why I pointed out the 600 pound gorilla is, is distorting uh, interpretations of uh, what Genesis actually says. Paul? Right here. Yes. I want to go back to what Nancy V. Meister was saying on pre-existing matter. Um, church has a lot more work to do on that in terms of sharing new research with especially laity. I was uh, once editor of Ministry Magazine when all these issues about Ellen White and use of sources came up, we published a special issue of ministry in 1981, 
and we showed some of the parallels between her statements and her predecessors who were evangelical conservative Christians. <coughs> One of them was on pre-existing matter. Now, I was going to follow up. If I had been editor for many more years there, I was going to have an article on the source of Ellen White's concepts on pre-existing matter. She did not invent them. If you go to her, her uh, typewritten, it's now typewritten manuscript, 1897, where she has the pre-existing matter statements, there's a lot more context. And it's almost verbatim from another book called The Complete Duty of Man, very popular 19th century work. It was a revision of a, another book by the same author called The Whole Duty of Man. And if you read the whole chapter in Whole Duty of Man on God and his infinite power, he's arguing against deism because that was originally written in the 18th century. And the deist said, well, God is kind of uh, somewhat a powerless God. He's more like a craftsman. He can take what's there and he can reshape it and bring something new. But he's not the almighty, all-powerful creator. And this author is arguing against deism as well as Ellen White. And Ellen White is using it in a new context to argue against John Harvey Kellogg. So if we put all that together, we see she's not dealing with the age of the earth. She's dealing with the nature of God. Is God just a artisan or God, is God an almighty creator? And like Steve mentioned, that's true. God he could have, or God could use pre-existing matter, but he was not dependent upon it like a craftsman. Well, anyway, that's the summary <laughs> of the article I never wrote. <laughs> <laughs> a point of clarification, are we talking about pre-existing matter that he himself had created before and left, and then he's coming back to, is that? Yes, that that's is never correct. been spelled out. So I just yeah. wanted to get it spelled well, in, out. Well, in here. the case of in the case of the creation of man and the creation of woman, it's very clear that he took material and then he Already. formed it in one case and he built it in the other case, and uh, uh, and in fact in in Genesis uh, two. You even have animals being formed in the same way, out of the dust of the ground. Um, uh, God formed animals and brought them to the man and let, uh, let him name them and let him realize that, that none of them really matched what he needed. Um, and so you have, you have that part of it. Uh, pardon me? Well, uh, actually, this book. Is, yeah, among how many other people are going to read that book? Well, that is true. <laughs> I ordered it and it didn't come yet. <laughs> that is true. It's a. Um, One thing that we forget is that language is changing general knowledge is changing. We've talked about matter. Well, the astronomers are talking about dark matter, more abundant than matter. What's dark matter? They don't know. Well, obviously, it has gravitational interactions with matter, but beyond that, it's, there's, there's very little that can be said about it. And maybe it has other interactions. Maybe that's the part of the universe that could sing for joy. Uh, we're not really, we don't really understand. The other thing is, the other thing is, uh, the Big Bang, keep in mind, is a mathematical limitation that matter must exist until it gets so far it can't exist. And then, uh, and basically, when you keep going backwards, you hit a singularity where the laws of physics don't work. Right. Because they have to do things like divide by zero. Right. Um, and, uh, 
and, and that's, that's the standard Big Bang Theory. It may turn out that the universe is created by a much more rapid process. Um, it may turn out, it, even if you go back to the Big Bang, though, you are faced with what looks for all the world like a God who creates everything out of nothing and who, at that point, is not indebted to pre-existing matter. That's true. And, you know, if we <coughs> try to... What we're talking about today, in our language today, may sound like utter nonsense in a few more years. And honestly, it sounded... What we're talking about today, if they had been writing this in the 1800s, or speaking this, they'd have been a candidate for the funny farm. Not the sanitarium, but the insane asylums. Um, there's another, th there's another th I, th I think, a couple of things that, that we can pull in with this that don't come from Genesis itself. Uh, the biggest argument for an old universe is the fact that some things give all the appearances of being, well, light years back. And if you want to get very specific, we'll just take the star Polaris, which if you measure where Polaris is by, by looking at it in, say, July and in January and, and, and seeing how much it moves across uh, uh, compared to the background of stars. Um, you get it, if I remember correctly, what is it, 300 light years or something like that? Um, and there are other stars that appear to be very similar to Polaris that, that look like they're much fainter, um, that, that look like they're further back than, uh, than 10,000 years. And at that point, if they were created and then their light were to reach the Earth without something being done about it, they wouldn't be seen now. If you have a whole galaxy, which apparently, you know, galaxies look like they're uh, 100,000 light years across or something like that, um, Andromeda Galaxy is perhaps, what, a million light years away, something like that? So, so you know, we're talking uh, we're talking about galaxies that shouldn't even be seen right now, if you created them six thousand or even ten thousand years ago, and that's the that's the problem that you have when you try to model an entire universe being created in six days. <laughs> Uh, I think one of the things that would help is if uh, whoever wrote it is familiar both with the biblical text and with the scientific theories. And that's really what needs to be done is to create a kind of a unified or a, a, a integrated science religion model. And uh, people, are, people have done that in, in kind of broad outline, but but not usually have uh, not usually putting things in a way that 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 hits everybody as obvious. You know, the the church now is is going through the Old Testament. They're going to have another one in the New Testament uh, in another year or two, looking at creation in the New Testament, and. I think eventually they're going to deal with the scientific questions. And I think one of the things that would be useful for us is rather than trying to tell us what to believe, it would be to give us the information on which the models are based so that we can make that assessment ourselves. And, uh, I, and then that way, if something changes in the next few years, which certainly can happen, then we go back and say, well, this argument's no, no longer any good, this argument's no longer any good, and now we have a good argument for this, and we can rebuild relatively easily because we have all the parts. And, and that's the way I would like to see it done. 
rather than people telling, well, the universe must be 13.7 billion years old. Well, how do you know? That's the question. And it needs to be very clear as to this is the, these are the models you have to struggle with. You know, and there are models that try to explain why the universe looks old when the Earth is supposed to be only, uh, Russell Humphreys has one, uh, uh, what's his name, I can't remember the, the Australian. Um, Centerfield. Uh, pardon me? Centerfield. Centerfield has another one. Um, and there are people who say, well, the light was, they were created with the light already on the earth, uh, on its way to the earth. And that's kind of a, of course, once you do that, you're outside of scientific contestable models because at that point anything can happen. And, you know, maybe that's the way eventually somebody's going to uh, resolve the problem. But if you do, you need to say up front that, you know, we don't, have any business saying that science isn't looking at the evidence, that in fact they are looking at the evidence and they're making the most reasonable interpretation that doesn't involve any kind of miracle. Has our church ever taught that the whole universe was created in six days? I, I wasn't aware of it. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't know about that. Uh, well, I, I've actually, never, I've, uh, here's I the used thing. to study a lot here's in the, the past. Thing. The uh, Adventist past. church um, is a little bit like a herd of cats. <laughs> go. They go whichever Everybody way whichever they want to go, and and you will find people advocating for the whole shebang being could, created in 6,000 years. I could believe that, but as, you a, will find, as a church, as, our, well, as uh, a denomination, okay, what has the closest it been thing to an official position we have on this probably comes from either the Biblical Research Institute or the Geoscience Research Institute. Probably more from the Geoscience, because the Biblical Research Institute doesn't try to create mm -hmm. scientific models most yeah. of the time. But there was no official pronouncement. But you will find people in that department who will say one thing or another. Robert Brown is famous for saying that the, uh, that's right. that the uh, earth that's being referred to is actually the, the atmosphere, uh, the, the heavens are actually the atmosphere of the earth. And specifically excluding the sun and the, the sun and the moon. That that this is actually from a narrator from the position of Earth, and what happens is at first it was all darkness, and then light could get through, but it was really hard to tell, and then there was something clear enough that you could actually see a source of light that you could call the greater light, and another source that you could call the lesser light, <coughs> and uh, as things cleared up, you could see more. Um, which raises interesting questions about the stars. Presumably, um, though, that Adam was told because he wasn't there. God reviewed that history of how he was <coughs> created, and he passed it on. So how, I don't know how it could be from the point of view well, of... Well, actually, next week I think we'll get into some of that. Oh, okay. Um, because, because they will be discussing the two creation accounts, whether they're complementary or whether they <coughs> are contradictory. And, uh, and part of that discussion come, uh, gets into, <coughs> you know, why the two different accounts. So we're hopefully we'll cover that. With reference to that, it might be interesting. If you look in the Advents Review at the... Uh, Proceedings of the uh, last general conference. Uh, you may not know the background of this. There was a definite move on the part of the theologians at Andrews University to try and insert a statement in uh, number six, our fundamental belief that was revised, uh, to the effect that there was a gap. It, it would be Davidson's soft gap theory, a gap between the first creation and the second. Uh, and uh, it was uh, 
proposed on the floor and so on and went to committee. It was discussed in committee and the uh, comment was reduced to a semicolon. Uh, they did not put it in there. Uh, it leaves, uh, it leaves uh, one statement and a semicolon and then the other statement. Uh, but it doesn't say that one is earlier than the other. You can insert a gap there and if you don't want to, you don't have to. The, so <laughs> the, the, uh, the editor of the review said, uh, semicolon, is, this explains it. They, they didn't want to get specific on this. Uh, they felt it was not biblical per se, although I think you could argue from Davidson's point that it definitely is biblical. I grew up with the notion, uh, we still always hear, says uh, truth is progressive. Uh, not quite right. Our understanding of truth is progressive. Um, the truth itself is the same, we're just uh, Absolutely, it. yes. Yeah. Yes, our understanding, you see, you see, uh, our most beloved president was bled to death. That was the treatment for pneumonia. That's right. Mercury was the best medication ever. Well, truth is progressive. I, I think what you said is invaluable. Mm -hmm. in that e even in my lifetime, uh, when I started teaching advanced cardiac life support, we used two amps of bicarbon, everybody right. who came in. Yeah. And uh, the first, uh, and then uh, at first they said, well, you only actually need one. <laughs> and then, then you well, you may not it. even need that, and now you don't need that at all, yeah. and it's never come back. So, uh, yeah, we, we do have, uh, and this is one of the reasons why, rather than trying to adjust everything and come up with the model, I think we're better off saying, if you go with a model that has these characteristics, here's the things you have to deal with. If you go with a model in these characteristics, here's the things you have to deal with. And in one way, what, one of the things we're doing is we're looking at the biblical story and we're saying, if you just take it the way it is, what kind of a story do you get out of it? And I think that that's an important point. Amen. Uh, and then, you know, you can decide... Well, you know, I'm going to buy 90% of it, but this one little piece I'm not going to, I'm not going to take. Uh, but then you have to say, frankly, that there's some part of the Bible that you, you don't take. A, and, and see, part of the reason, and this is really important, is because there's some things that are said about Scripture in the Protestant Reformation, which I think happens to be correct. And one of them is, of course, that the Scriptures are... are uh, uh, the scriptures are authoritative and they're authoritative by themselves but there's another piece that people miss and that is it's called the perspicuity of scripture and that means you can understand it and that means you don't have to have a PhD to understand it that Amen. Uh, and, and what that means is that we don't have any business going and trying looking at the the outside stuff, when we get done with our interpretation, it should be one that once you lay out the facts, well, that's kind of the obvious interpretation. And I think we make a mistake when we try to, when we try to fit everything together and then tell people, you don't look at how the sausage is made. Just eat the sausage. <laughs> well, talk take, it, about take it as it reads. Talk about Amiodarone and Lidocaine, for example. They work the same. Uh, well, uh, Amiodarone guys paid $6 million to the American College of uh, Thoracic Surgery and they built their headquarters in Dallas. So, well, we're going to push Amiodarone. Make no sense. No, who has the stick? That's what counts, you see. Who can make the most? Who has the stick? Obama has the stick. But uh, hopefully for, yeah. Uh, the thing is, um, the Lord question is, in the 70s, we used to hear that song, God said it and I believe it. Well, not quite so. He gave us the intelligence to think and reason it among ourselves. Uh, yeah, well, our understanding of truth is progressive and we've got to have an inquiring mind. Uh, and that's mighty important. And, and this is one of, the, one of the things I think is important. 
part of our job is to be thinkers and not mere reflectors Absolutely. of other people's Absolutely. thoughts. And what that means is that we have to be able to get as close as possible to the raw data as we can. And then look at it ourselves and say, well, this is the best way I see to build things, to, to fit things together into the model that we have. And that's what we really need. We need that kind of thing. Um, and that means that we should be doing science in a whole different way from some of our competitors who want to have it all packaged and here's what you believe and just, you know, take it from yeah. there. Yeah. That's not going to work. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. Uh, we should be thinkers and not mere reflectors of other men's thoughts. That's the, the job of education is to create. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 we don't want to just appeal, appeal to mystery when we don't have to. And uh, to do some hard thinking, you know, that's what we're trying to do now. I mean, we're obviously yeah. discussing things in that manner. And there's a good reason for that, because Jesus says in Matthew, Therefore, every teacher of the law who has been instructed about the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of the house who brings out of his storehouse, storeroom, new treasures as well as old. Right. And we're looking for those new treasures, and we, uh, and we should we not also be afraid of to, asking the questions we, that lead to We them. need to keep the old treasures at the same time. And now, now we get to figure out... You know, how does, exactly. this, how does yeah. this all fit into a, a, a paradigm? And I'll give you another example of one of the, of the major argument from a scientific point of view for the Earth being old. And I've talked to Robert Brown about this. I've talked to some other people about this. And the major argument was that we are missing isoto radio radioactive isotopes that have less than so much for their half-life. Um, usually, they would say less than uh, one billion years. Uh, and that means that we don't have any plutonium-244, even though, theoretically, it, it's, it's an easy isotope to make because it doesn't uh, uh, its half-life is too low, uh, too low, and it should have been all decayed if, if the Earth is 4 billion years old. Uh, we still do have potassium-40. Its half-life is only about oh, 1.25 billion years, but that means there's an eighth of, uh, or a sixteenth of what theoretically there should have been if the Earth is 5 billion years old. And... Uh, there's a whole bunch of other isotopes of the same general kind, um, uh, iodine-127, manganese-53. There's a lot of them that if the Earth was created, say, 10,000 years ago or 6,000 years ago, uh, that they should still be around, but they're not. Now, I have to back off a little bit and say that depends on meteorites. They can be because they can be created by cosmic rays. And so we, for example, find man manganese-53 um, and stuff like that. Uh, if we don't find that on the Earth and we find that um, elsewhere in the universe, it raises the question whether the Earth is so old that those have all decayed away. Now, there is a problem with that now that has just in the last probably th five years come out, and that is that we've discovered that decay, decay rates are not always constant. And there is some evidence that in some cases, in particular in uh, uranium going to lead, that the, uh, through several steps, that the, um, that the decay has accelerated uh, considerably. And so that leg of saying the substance of the earth must be old has gotten a little wobbly because, because if there's been accelerated decay, then you can't really say for sure. Uh, one of the things that I think would be fascinating, and Adventists, and I think other creations for that matter, should be interested in this kind of stuff, would be to go back through the geologic column and find, let's say, uh, as I understand, there are some uh, 
meteorites that hit during the uh, Ordovician and see how many and what kinds of those isotopes are still in those meteorites. And the reason I say that is because we could conceivably, if we found out, for example, that they had carbon-14 and they had beryllium-10, which is arguable from the data we have, but they only have a quarter of the amount of potassium-40 that, you, uh, 40 that you'd expect, and that they had uh, none of the, uh, let's say, the iodine-127, and no plutonium, that you could start saying, well, maybe uh, accelerated decay is based partly on the, on the molecular weight of the, uh, or the, the atomic weight of the isotope. Uh, we could suddenly have something that might make a lot of sense out of that data. And it's, it's a wide open field for us because people who believe in long ages for the age of the Earth aren't going to even think about trying to look for those kinds of things. And I think we make a mistake by either a pure fideism or a, um, or a surrender to the standard model. I think that we should be asking ourselves whether there are other models that might make other predictions and we should go test them. Uh, that's what I did on carbon-14, and it seems to have turned out pretty well. Anyway, that's, uh, that's the way I see it. Next week, I hope to have a special article in which the creator is mentioned that got into PLOS One and then got out of PLOS One. What? Well, I took a, I took a, um, I, I took an archive of it just in case oh, they erased good, it. Good, good. It, <laughs> it's mentioned once in the abstract and I guess twice in the article. And, yeah. And so they've thrown it out. We've, we'll, we'll quote, we'll quote it. I, I have, I have that saved in my computer.